Uh, those of us, those of you who have joined us, um, uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to be starting in um, two minutes.
Okay, uh, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, welcome to the Politics of Displacement and Contradictions of Humanitarianism webinar. This webinar is hosted by the Earth and Environmental Sciences Program here at the Graduate Center, the City University of New York, and sponsored by the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at Hunter College, CUNY, and the Department of Political Science and Global Affairs and the Geography Program at the College of Staten Island, CUNY. Uh, this webinar is co-coordinated and co-moderated by my colleague, uh, Dr. Mariana Pavlovskaya, who is a professor and chair of the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at Hunter College and graduate faculty at the EES program at the Grad Center. And myself, I'm Peter Kabachnik. I'm a professor of geography at the College of Staten Island CUNY and graduate faculty here at the EES program at the Graduate Center as well. Uh, first off, uh, I just want to say that uh, this is being recorded um, and will the Q&A portion will not be recorded. Uh, today, uh, we're going to hear about a number of critical issues uh, facing uh, displaced people today. Our focus is uh, necessarily broad because of the need to explore a plethora of different aspects when thinking about displacement. In an article uh, I co-authored with one of our panelists, uh, Beth Michnik, as well as Olga uh, Mayerova and Joanna Rogulska, we tried to capture the wide variety of issues pertaining to the displaced by referring to it as the multiple geographies of displacement. This umbrella term covers issues ranging from economic hardship, basic survival, violence, uh, relying on social networks, dealing with trauma, uh, changing identities and practices, uh, placemaking, to basic everyday struggles of finding food, taking care of elderly parents, uh, getting their children to school, and to the time spent just waiting. It also encompasses how NGOs, INGOs, and the humanitarian networks constrain, assist, frustrate, and ignore the displaced. It also includes how various countries, from where they were displaced to the countries they transited through, uh, to where they settled, uh, how those countries govern and manage the displaced and often use them as geopolitical tools. Even though we can only cover a fraction of these critical issues, I'm excited to see what our amazing experts will share with us today. Uh, before I end, I just wanna let you know what the format is for today. Uh, each of our esteemed panelists will speak for about 10 minutes and then we will have the Q&A afterwards. Feel free to use the Q&A function. Uh, we will try to get to as many of the questions uh, after the speakers are done as possible. Uh, in terms of a preview of what's to come, uh, just uh, you know, uh, a sliver. Uh, we have both uh, Elizabeth Cullen Dunn and Beth Michnik, who have just recently returned from Poland, and uh, they were there assisting Ukrainian refugees. We all have we also have expertise on the Syrian crisis uh, and area coverage in other places like Lebanon, India, Georgia, among other topics. Uh, we provided six different prompts to the panelists and asked everyone to choose the two they would like to respond to. Uh, the issues they will consider include sh sharing their experiences and expertise, thinking about how we can speak broadly about displacement when local contexts are so variable, responding to the lack of uniformity in the global responses to different populations of the displaced, thinking about placemaking, how geographers in particular can add to the debate and to offer their insights to what the future of displacement will and should look like. As you can see, these are wide ranging themes, which I think will give us all a glimpse of the multiple geographies of displacement. Now I wanna turn it over to Mariana, who will introduce our amazing panelists. Mariana, you're, you're muted. It keeps happening. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to thank you for an amazing introduction to the panel. Um, I also want to thank everyone who is attending today. And of course, uh, thank our uh, esteemed and um, really amazing panelists for agreeing to uh, tackle on those very important and difficult issues, especially in today's context. So our panelists, I'm just going to go um, uh, from one to another. Um, the first one is Beth Michnik. Um, Peter, did you get the slide? Oh, okay, great. So Beth Michnik is Professor Emerita at the University of Arizona. Uh, 
She specializes in research on forced migration due to violent conflict. She has conducted extensive field research in Georgia about displaced people due to the conflict in Abkhazia and the Russian invasion of South Ossetia, um, as well as in Ukraine after the first invasion um, by Russia in 2014. She has published many articles on Georgian IDPs, internally displaced persons, in leading geography and interdisciplinary journals. Uh, great to see you, uh, Beth, welcome. Our next panelist is Dr. Elizabeth Colin Dunn, who is the director of the Center for Refugee Studies at Indiana University. She has conducted research in Poland since 1991, which resulted in the book, Privatizing Poland, Baby Food, Big Business, and the Remaking of Labor. She also conducted research on the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008, which was published in her book, No Path Home. I believe that she's working on another book on the crisis, on refugee crisis in Ukraine right now. Um, great to see you, Elizabeth. Um, welcome to the panel. Um, the next panelist is Dr. Dean Sharp who received his PhD from CUNY Graduate Center in 2018. And right now, Dean is a fellow in human geography in the Department of Geography and Environment at the London School of Economics. He is co-editor of the books, Beyond the Square, Urbanism and the Arab Uprisings, and Open Gaza, Architectures of Hope. Dean is currently based in Khartoum, Sudan. Great to see you, Dean. Welcome. Um, our next uh, expert is uh, Ramola Sanyal, um, who is an associate professor in urban geography at the London School of Economics. She has worked on displacement and urbanization in the Middle East and South Asia. She has co-edited two books, <clears throat> excuse me, including the volume, Urbanizing Citizenship, Contested Spaces in Indian Cities, and Displacement, Global Conversations on Refuge. Um, great to meet you, uh, Ramola. Welcome um, to the panel. And our last expert uh, is Amar Azuz, who is a London-based architect and writer. Amar completed his PhD in architecture at the University of Bath. And since 2019, he has been a short-term research associate at the University of Oxford. Amar joined Arup, an urban consulting group, in 2017. His book, Domicide, Architecture, War, and the Destruction of Home in Syria, will be published by Bloomsbury in 2023. Congratulations on the book. Amar, and great to meet you and welcome to the panel. So um, I would like to introduce also Peter Kabachnik, uh, my colleague um, here. Um, Peter is a professor of geography at the College of State and Island um, at CUNY and CUNY Graduate Center. His work focuses on geographies of authoritarianism and how personality cults serve as political technologies of discipline and socio-spatial control. His other research has examined contemporary understandings of Stalin and the Soviet era in Georgia and Georgian IDPs. And myself, I am Mariana Pavlovska. I'm chair of the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at Hunter College CUNY and a faculty member at CUNY Graduate Center. My research focuses on urban space and geographies of diverse economies and solidarity economies in Russia and the United States. Some of my recent work examined the emergence of ontologies of poverty in Russia. And I'm also now uh, working on the book with my colleagues on the US solidarity cities. So um, again, uh, welcome everyone. Um, and uh, Peter, I'm just handing it over right to um, our participants. And um, the first is Beth. 
Hi, I did the same as Mariana. <laughs> I muted myself. Um, before I start, I want to thank Peter and Mariana very much for organizing this series of webinars and Elizabeth for all of her support over the many years and especially jumping into Poland and the Ukrainian and the Polish people in particular and the um, PA, Polish Humanitarian Action, which is an NGO in Poland with which I volunteered. I returned on Sunday night, so everything's swirling around in my head, and I'm going to attempt to make sense of what I experienced over the last few weeks. Um, I thought I'd start out just by showing a definition about humanitarianism. This isn't the only definition. Um, I'd like to highlight here to varying degrees that basic or immediate needs of assistance and protection are focused on. Um, what do the people see when they come across the border? This is a handout that is given. It's one side is in English and one side, as you see here, is in Ukrainian. And it points to all the different places along the border and then the reception points that people from Ukraine can go to. It tells them what their rights are and what they can expect in Poland, which is a really nice, warm welcome. And we've been talking about um, talks being really positive. I'm really positive, but I also want to say that there is an underlying um, something that's bubbling up that I know is going to show up very soon. But I spent two weeks um, welcoming people. And these are the spaces of welcome that I was in. Um, they're sponsored by PA, Polish Humanitarian Action. The image on my left is a tent that was at the pedestrian crossing at Hrebene which is a relatively small border crossing. But this tent was set up to greet the people who are walking across the border. And just to give you a sense of the people who are walking across the border, they're generally people without baggage, or they might have a few bags of things. But we welcome them with food, a warm place to be. There's games for the children, almost anything you can imagine. But you might need, we've got there. The other space is for the bus crossing, again, at Hrebene. And you can see it's all about placemaking, which I'll talk about in a second. But to give you the punchline of what I believe I experienced is really a remaking and a recharacterization of borders. I live by the US-Mexico border, and that is a highly militarized, contested border. We don't need to rehearse that. I think we all have an understanding of that kind of discipline and exclusion that the borders and the border management infrastructure is engaged in. This turns it on its head. This border, these borders in Poland, become borders of welcome and inclusion and safety for people. And it's constructed by so many different actors. And I have in the blue here, all the different people that participate in this kind of placemaking. And we all have different contributions to make. And who crosses the border here? A lot of different people cross the border. So of course, there were many, many Ukrainians that were fleeing um, just danger and the unthinkable. I met Georgian fighters. I met Americans that were fighting or providing medical aid. There were thrill seekers from around the world that had gone on like tourism to Ukraine. Um, people of all ages, refugee sponsors. So we met people that had, um, one woman had found a way to bring 190 Ukrainians to England and had their visas. So a lot of things going on. And I really found that there was a lot of this homemaking, placemaking and staking out our contribution. So for those of you on the panel that know me, you'll um, smile when I say this. If you see here, there's a little orange piece of paper and we all have our contributions. So what was my contribution to that placemaking there? And I can talk lots more about this in the Q&A, but I felt that people needed a clean, warm, welcoming place to be. And not all the volunteers knew what to do to create that. So one morning I walked in and before the slew and the onslaught of buses started coming, I made out a list for all the volunteers so they would know what needed to be cleaned, what needed to be resupplied, and how to greet people. Another volunteer 
you can see the kava and the chai. He made sure that there were permanent signs and he made recipes so that we could make sure that we were showing the best to the people that were coming across, giving comfort, giving bags of goodies. One volunteer said, I want the kids to feel like they're leaving the hospital after a stay, you know, some great delight. And there was just so much of this going on. Um, and I'm gonna show you a few. This was in the same space that we were in. This was really a space of welcoming. T-Mobile was there giving out SIM cards. World Central Kitchen was there. So we had a central hub. Now that central hub was often not a place where um, people wanted to go because it was a space that was indoors. There were a lot of people. So there was often a lot of, um, a lot of the people coming from Ukraine that just didn't wanna be there and inside, inside spaces. So we started to do more bringing the inside out. So this is a picture of a Belgian um, volunteer who brought all the humanitarian aid that he possibly could on a tray out to people. So we were claiming this one little space, but then also claiming the outside space, which is really militarized in many senses. We weren't allowed to take photographs or anything, but the volunteers were finding ways to make it welcoming to people that came in, in such distress. And I did put up a picture of me with two children and I want you to note how big their backpacks are. These were children that were carrying their own. And the best thing that you could do in any day is just make someone smile. And so what was this space like, this welcoming, inclusive, safe space? It was one in which people smiled. Ukrainians would get there and they would smile. They would sigh, cry. And this was all something that we were interacting with one another around. Um, one woman, I remember saying to her, she just didn't want to come inside. She just didn't want food. She was kind of peeking in the door. And I said, well, we have Reniki. And her face just lit up. And that's what she wanted. And she then agreed to come in and take the welcome, which was incredible. There were so many people who wanted to tell us their stories that wanted to be listened to, told us about 48 hours without food, about having to cut their hair off because one, there was no water and two, it might make them less attractive to the Russian soldiers. So there was just a lot going on, a lot of interaction um, across these areas and spaces. Um, I, I do want to say that it wasn't all wonderful, that there were definitely people who were refused. So there's still that border of exclusion. There was a Russian, a man who held a Russian passport who'd been trying desperately to get into Ukraine. This was his third refusal along the border. And then there were other people, particularly women with their children, who didn't have the appropriate documents. So while I'm talking about all this, I, I do recognize that there was another side, which I'm very happy to talk about. Um, there, this is the last about the agency of the Ukrainians themselves. We were at the bus stop and a bus came from Kharkiv. They were ballerinas and opera singers and they did a spontaneous concert at the border. That's what they wanted to do. So what's distinctive about this trans-border humanitarianism? Um, and I would ask every single person I talk to about um, why are you here? Why are you a volunteer at the border? And I heard many similar things. So that's one minute. What if Ukraine falls or a common enemies? Um, one thing that was new to me 10% of the residents of my town were Ukrainian. And I want you to note that this flow of people that you see on the screen is from 2019. And so th there's a million Ukrainians living in Poland right now, which I think gives it a little bit of a diff oops, different um, situation. And just very quickly to wrap this up with implications, um, somehow I put on, um, Titles, subtitles. But anyway, this transborder um, humanitarianism, we see competitive compassion, volunteers being competitive with one another over who's more compassionate. There's gaps among the volunteers, so it's not always so rosy. We need some training around issues of integration. There may be more likelihood of successful integration, but also there's really a need for coordinating. 
And it does show, though, a very powerful expression of transborder social movement to save Ukraine. When people would say, why am I there? I'd say for them. And that was um, an amazing experience. So thank you. Thank you both so much. Elizabeth, please. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And Beth, I'm amazed to hear about your experience, which so much echoed mine. I was at the Polish-Ukrainian border uh, starting in early March, and I was there for about two and a half, three weeks. Um, so, so Beth and I are part of a group of people which has arranged almost continuous coverage at the border since the war broke out, um, which has given us a lot of chances to see how things evolve. Um, so just so you can get a sense of uh, who's where, Beth was here at Hrebenne, and the three places that I spent the most time at were Budomir, Korchova, and Medica. Um, and this has been an enormous contrast to my experience in Georgia. I spent 16 months in a camp there in 2009 um, into 2010. Um, and it was a completely different experience. So a lot of what I'm trying to do is reflect on those differences. Um, one of the questions that Peter and Mariana put to us is whether it makes sense to connect and generalize localized, localized experiences of displacement, violence, and relief efforts. And I would argue that it does for one reason, which is that there is a giant uh, trans-border institutional organization of aid agencies that is centered around the United Nations, particularly uh, UNHCR, which is the High Commission for Refugees, and OCHA, which is the Office for the um, Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And the Humanitarian International is in fact a network that involves donor governments, it involves other UN agencies, international NGOs, local NGOs, and so on, which are knit together in complex relations of subcontracting. One of the um, results of this international institutionalization is that these agencies very, offer, very often offer what Peter Redfield has called a kit, which is a standardized aid response, which is portable from place to place and which is largely free of context. So for example, when I was in Georgia, I noticed, uh, I saw one um, aid proposal that went to the flash appeal, which is the UN's funding mechanism. And the organizers had uh, replaced the word Congo with the word Georgia, but had forgotten to replace the word Congolese with the word Georgian. So we saw the error and they were, they were proposing a project which was extremely suitable for Congo. It was a breastfeeding support project but which was largely unneeded in Georgia where breastfeeding is widely practiced, where they had clean water through the conflict where formula was available and so on. So um, one of the questions that the Ukrainian crisis has brought to the fore is whether the standardized response, the mass produced response that the aid agencies offer actually is of any use in a situation like this. Um, in Ukraine, refugees are going directly into a highly developed country. And there was, as Beth pointed out, a very strong volunteer response in Poland in which millions of people were giving of their time and money to help Ukrainians. Um, one poll I saw said that 70% of Polish adults were somehow involved in providing aid to Ukrainians. Um, and that response, that volunteer response was not organized by and large by the international NGOs, which were very late to the table. Um, the UN posted its first job ads for response uh, earlier this week. Um, HIAS, which is the Jewish Relief Agency, didn't post an ad for a relief response coordinator until uh, March the 25th, a, a month into the war. So um, I think the Ukrainian um, response has really posed a challenge to international aid. Uh, 
international aid is really um, very Fordist in its organization. It is based on the mass production and distribution of standardized goods. And refugee camps were developed not for the convenience of refugees, but for the convenience of aid agencies and host states. So much of what a camp is designed to do is make distribution of standardized goods in a highly standardized way uh, possible. And it's much less possible for people who live in urban areas. So a lot of what Ivona Kalashevska and I are looking at now is how that response is different in Ukraine where people did not go in by and large into refugee camps. There are some people in shelters, but millions of people are living in other people's homes as guests. Um, and where what is needed for them is jobs and housing rather than cots and pots and hygiene kits and so on. The things that aid agencies are good at distributing. Aid agencies do not have the capacity in general to engage in large scale job creation or provide a housing that is not temporary. So um, one of the, you know, you can see, we saw an IOM tent. Um, we took a picture of it every day. This is at the crossing at Budomierz. There was another one at Medica. Took a picture of it every day and it was empty every day for the 20 days we were there. Nothing ever happened in there because I think it was just unclear how to respond. So um, Ivona and I have started thinking a lot about what we call um, distributed humanitarianism, which is self-organized via the internet. Um, and there were millions of polls involved in this. One group, Pomoczla Ukraini, when I took this screen grab of it, had 26,000 members. Three weeks later, it had over half a million members. And people were posting needs, and immediately tens of people or hundreds of people would respond them, to them. So if a, a volunteer posted, we need toothpaste at the Warsaw train station, 15 people would say, I'm bringing a case right now. Um, other volunteers made what they called virtual warehouses, where instead of relying on an aid agency for goods, they posted their needs and volunteers met them very quickly um, for these transitory needs, not for apartments and jobs, unfortunately, but for temporary housing, um, for help getting kids into school, for um, hygiene needs and so on. These were all met by volunteers in Poland, not by the international aid community. So we've been thinking a lot about the ways that aid is now not just using the internet, but is like the internet in the sense that you have what we're calling packet delivery, except that here it's not a metaphor, it's literal. Um, that instead of having one large behemoth aid, institutionalized aid machine, um, you have millions of small donations, millions of one-off volunteers or people who are individually volunteering. And so we have what we call small, smart, and many, as opposed to one and exquisite. Um, and this decentralization of the aid machine I think poses massive challenges to our understanding of humanitarianism. Um, I think a lot about Airbnb and Marriott as a comparison. You know, when Airbnb started up, it did not ask Marriott to change. It did not try and reform Marriott. What it did instead was create an architecture in which millions of people could engage in hand-to-hand -hand chains um, and, and Airbnb facilitated that rather than trying to change and reform institutions. And so I think a lot of what we're seeing is a similar digital disruption in the humanitarian aid industry. Um, so I think increasingly we'll see this happening in other cases. It will be a lot harder in cases where the host community is poor. It will be a lot harder in cases where the host community is hostile. But I think in more and more cases where it's appropriate, we're gonna see the aid community trying to figure out how institutions fit into a landscape in which volunteers are doing it themselves. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth, so much. Um, our next speaker uh, will be um, Dean. Dean Sharp, please go ahead. 
I didn't Great. see you. Thank you so much. <laughs> And yeah, it's wonderful to be uh, to be back home, uh, even if virtually. Uh, I did my PhD at CUNY under Mariana, and uh, thank you so much for having me. And it's it's wonderful to to be with you again. And thank you, Peter, as well. And um, I, responding to some of the questions sent, want to kind of just give a broad overview of how we should think about humanitarianism, um, and a bit of historical geography. Then just going in a bit in terms of how it's intersected with my own work in the Arab region, and then to think about uh, thinking forward, but also very much in the present to touch upon the significance of humanitarianism in broader international frameworks. The first thing to say is that humanitarianism is very difficult to position yourself against or be critical of. I think Beth and Elizabeth have articulated that quite powerfully in the case of uh, Ukraine. You know, how can you critique a program of, as I quote, aid and action to save lives, alleviate suffering and maintain and protect human dignity? In a global context in which the subject of the stranger is the target of so much systematic and targeted violence, how could a progressively minded individual be against the adjective humanitarian? It refers to the idea of saving strangers. But the historical and contemporary lessons of humanitarianism, its various shapes and forms are clear. We must not cast aside our analytical and critical tools when faced with a humanitarian framework or action. Indeed, we must redouble our efforts. Insist on nuance in the rush to generalize, insist on political clarity in the face of apolitical facades. In my own work on the con in the context of Lebanon, Palestine, and Syria, I've often been faced with the intricate politics and ethical challenges that humanitarian interventions bring. In the project that I'm working on called Lebanon Unsettled, that traces the historical and geographical context of the 2019 protests in Lebanon, we examine a revolt that occurred in 1821. We interrogate questions such as to what extent the French Revolution of 1789, or more pertinently for today's discussion, the Greek Revolution of 1821 influenced the revolt in Lebanon. Now the Greek Re Revolution has enormous significance for the history of humanitarianism. Humanitarianism is not a new phenomena, nor is it newly politicized. The 1827 Battle of Narvarino, historians have noted, is one of the first instances of humanitarian intervention. This is where the forces of uh, taking action explicitly referred to humanitarian intervention. The war involved a joint naval battle by Britain, France, and Russia against an Ottoman and Egyptian naval fleet in the Navarino Bay in modern day Greece. This was, of course, as much about the manoeuvring of the expanding and com competing big powers of Britain, Russia, and France, and the declining Ottoman Empire, as well as concerns about increased piracy disrupting merchant ships, as it was to any humanitarian concerns or even support for Greek independence. Humanitarianism is, in all places and at all times, shadowed by big power politics. It is a shadow that we as scholars must be alert to and do our utmost to examine. Humanitarianism is too differentiated, too complex, too time and space specific, too important for the most vulnerable on this planet to be opposed to or accepted in toto. Rather, claims to actually existing humanitarianism must be unsparingly interrogated and clarified. So in my own work, I've seen what I've termed negative humanitarianism in action all too often. Open Gaza, Architectures of Hope is an edited volume that I published along with the late Cooney professor and dear colleague, Michael Sorkin on the long displaced Palestinian population of Gaza. In this book, contributors often raise the specter of negative humanitarianism. Sarah Roy, for instance, writes how Israeli policies have purposefully transformed Gaza from a political issue into a humanitarian problem. She writes, Israel creates and maintains a humanitarian problem in order to manage a political one. Rather than saving strangers, 
Humanitarianism is a logic deployed to make the context of Gaza strange, inaccessible, to bury the clear and present political questions and conundrums. The Gaza reconstruction mechanism has been a powerful illustration of negative humanitarianism. Pietro Stefanini, in his contribution to our book, outlines how the language and logic of humanitarianism has been deployed by Israel in its disengagement plan and through the reconstruction mechanisms it established. Humanitarianism is part of the mechanism of Israel's colonial siege. Reconstruction of the built environment is often framed in humanitarian terms, but all too often, rather than providing the most marginalized and desperate with basic urban services, reconstruction is aimed at continuing conflict by other means, securing territory, displacing populations, securing circuits of capital through rents and the acquisition of prime land, often at the expense of those who are political, as well as perhaps economic opponents. This negative humanitarianism has been very much at work uh, in Syria, where my colleague as well, Amar Azuz, I'm sure will tell you more, we've been examining the ways in which reconstruction is used as a tool to continue conflict. But this is not to suggest that these violences uh, that are conducted and geopolitical strategies in the name of humanitarianism mean that we should just simply reject this notion and impose it on principle. Indeed, I talk from Khartoum, Sudan, where the humanitarian need is all too real and urgent. Wheat prices have risen nearly 200%, and the World Food Programme has warned that nearly 18 million people, 40% of the population could be in food insecure. That's double the number last year. A perfect storm of macroeconomic crisis, poor harvest, the military coup, increased food costs nationally and also globally, and all tangled up with the Ukraine crisis, are driving up this price of food to devastating effect. War is also ever present in Sudan. And of course, unlike Ukraine, is not dominating the media in America or anywhere else. Uh, for that matter. Even in Sudan, it can be difficult to know what is going on within the country. Indeed, just last week, militiamen uh, killed 200 people, 200 people in the Darfur region to little international or even national attention. The need for greater humanitarian assistance in Sudan is urgent, is needed. And despite the complexity in the way in which humanitarianism is deployed, let us be clear on the political economic states about humanitarian in particular. The United States is one of the largest providers of humanitarian aid in the world, provided 9 billion of humanitarian assistance in 2020. To put this in perspective though, the US spent 766 billion on the military in that same year. And Biden only last month increased the national defense budget by a further 29 billion. That's three times its total global humanitarian provision to uh, that sum. So let's be clear in terms of the power and force that humanitarianism has materially and as a logic. We live in the logic, we live under the logics of militarism, not humanitarianism. The, Screenshot, the, the slide I, I have in front of us is uh, the 1.94 billion is the amount requested for the humanitarian response uh, for Sudan. That 12% that you see is what has been funded. That's 248 million. Um, that I think is roughly a quarter of the Yankee Stadium. You know, just to give some type of perspective in terms of the resources that are being directed to a place like Sudan. This is the future, perhaps, of humanitarianism, abandonment of the most vulnerable of our planet. Okay, thank you, Dean, uh, so much um, for your perspective. So our uh, next speaker is um, Ramola Sanyal. Thank you so much, Mariana. And thank you again for this invitation to be part of this really interesting panel. Um, I seem to be the only person who doesn't have a PowerPoint. 
today, um, but I'm hoping that that's a good thing. Um, so I, I had suggested to Peter when I was approached to be part of this panel that I could perhaps speak to two of the prompts that he had suggested. Um, the first one of which was to discuss the various forms of placemaking that occurs during displacement, um, perhaps during flight, during return, while displaced by the humanitarian community and so forth. Now, I can't speak to all of it, but his prompts did make me think about a couple of things. Um, so I want to start out by, um, by talking about um, how we can think about placemaking processes during flight. Now I want to begin with the uh, tendency in, in uh, academic work and certainly in policy work as well, to think about those who are displaced through, through two temporal registers largely, uh, that is of instantaneity and that of stillness. Um, and geographers have often talked about how those who are displaced have very little control over um, the temporality of uh, their, their lives. Now, I wanna move away from these episodic narratives of displacement, of sudden flight, to think about how displacement occurs over longer and more continuous periods of time. And not just as something that occurs as episodic forms of violence, but also as structural forms of violence. And for my, my intervention here, then, I will draw on the work that I do in South Asia, which is one of the regions where um, I have conducted research. Now, on the borders of India and Bangladesh, for example, the partition of 1947 has never ended. For those who may not be familiar, the partition of 1947 cleaved what was British India into India and Pakistan, and it generated one of the largest migrations of people in modern history. So uh, we look at the, the numbers of vary depending on who you read, but it's anywhere between 10 to 15 million people. And there's an argument that is made by many scholars working on South Asia that this partition has never ended. And as the politics around that continue to unravel, so do the lives of people living in the border regions who are continuously subject to spatial and temporal ruptures through infrastructures of violence. So I draw on the work of Malini Shur, um, whose recent book, Jungle Passports, for example, outlines the ways in which fear of violence or death haunt the lives of those who live in these border regions between India and Bangladesh. People are subject to surveillance, control, and physical violence by the border security forces, both on the Indian and the Bangladeshi sides, who patrol these lethal borders. This is one of the hot, most highly populated borders in the world as well. This is one of the longest borders in the world. It is, I think, the longest border in the world. And it is a highly densely populated border with the border running through villages, sometimes people's homes, forests, and so forth. The places that these people make continually negotiate the desperation of their condition, which is often poverty, their attachment to the land and the kinship ties that crisscross this border, the complex ecological system that marks this land, and the opportunities and risks that, that are produced by the border infrastructures themselves. People are continually displaced, in other words, and continually move around the border, remaking this space and reconstituting ties. Now, by highlighting this, I want to shift away from the suddenness of departures to think about how displacement can occur through slow and continuous forms of persecution and violence that move people off their land and homes, not just at specific moments, but also over time. I also want to take this as an opportunity to blur the distinctions between whom we consider to be displaced and whom we consider to be migrants. Now, building on that, then I want to move on to talking about the places that are made during the time of displacement itself, which is the crux of my work um, at the moment. Now, I am an urban geographer. And my work has centrally interested itself in understanding the transformation of urban spaces through large scale displacement. I work in the global south where the vast majority of displacement takes place and where it is managed. And I see this as an important place in which to interrogate many of these questions. And I remind 
people that people move not just in ones and twos, but in the hundreds of thousands that may, as may be evident, but in, in much of the legal language, um, it, it continues to be an individualized process. But as these people move in hundreds and, and thousands, they often settle in different parts of the country or across the border close to their former homes. In doing so, they transform cities and regions, especially when crises become protracted, as they often are. I have long sought to show that those who are displaced are not just the subjects of humanitarian aid and support, but authors of their own lives, and importantly, city makers themselves. I do this by specifically turning to the politics of shelter and by showing how the act of building a house and making a home in a state of exile is in itself an act of politics and resistance. Now, again, I, I want to draw on my work on South Asia um, and point to the period in the immediate aftermath of partition to show how those who were displaced due to large scale, uh, because of the uh, violence in different uh, parts of the borders in that time, came to cities in India and Pakistan and transformed these cities, not just through their sheer numbers, and there were overwhelming numbers of people who came to many of these cities, but also through the acts that they engaged in at this time, through the occupation of land and houses, for example, through their entrance into the workforce at different levels and through their protests against the government's inaction, particularly within the Indian context, to support them uh, more proactively. And there's a lot to be said over here. Uh, there are caste politics that are involved. Um, there are different ways in which uh, people were uh, warehoused within the Indian context as well, which very much had to do with their social identities and the squatting process uh, which took place in, in many of the, the, uh, the outskirts of cities were also driven very much by people who had certain kinds of social capital. Um, and I'm happy to talk about many of those things during the Q&A as well. But if we, see this, if, if we see cities such as New Delhi or Calcutta today, um, they have evolved the way they have because of the ways in which refugees fundamentally transformed spaces and politics in these cities. Now, I acknowledge that partition was a unique period in time and that most urban refugees live in precarious conditions today and often clandestinely. But I would argue that perhaps we don't see much of these uh, kinds of politics taking place today because we do not allow it. And I will elaborate on that shortly. Now, shifting away from refugees as city makers themselves, I come to the humanitarian remaking of cities. Now, this has been a recent academic interest of mine because there's very little attention given over to how humanitarian aid and expertise transforms cities. Most displaced people in the world do not go into camps, but into cities. The humanitarian infrastructure has been slow to follow this trend as I've outlined elsewhere. Even today, although there is acknowledgement amongst many NGOs about the urbanization of displacement, the interventions tend to be ad hoc, but they are important. So a lot of the NGOs that I've in interviewed over time have talked about how they upgrade buildings. They also engage in neighborhood upgrading amongst other interventions to try and support displaced people in cities whilst not alienating the local communities who themselves may be poor and marginalized. This is particularly pronounced within the Middle East. And uh, I draw on the work that I had done in Lebanon. Such interventions thus turn the city itself into a site of humanitarian experimentation and into a new form of a camp, but with uneven effects. And we should ask ourselves, what effect does this have on urban politics, on urban planning, on communities and city governments in places where these interventions are taking place? How do we hold the organizations accountable for the impacts they have on places? Now, this leads me to the final point, which is through uh, one of the last prompts which was given, which is what should the future of humanitarian responses um, to displacement look like? And I would argue that the future needs to be urban because this is where displacement is shifting. The warehousing of people is not just wrong, it's also unhelpful 
both to those who are displaced, but also to those who are hosting them. Now, I acknowledge that encampment is a geopolitical and a security issue and not merely one of convenience of delivering aid. However, if the reality is that displacement is increasingly urban, it is unfortunate that both donors and aid organizations are not paying more attention to urban programming, not focusing on how to understand the specificities of urban governance and politics, and unwilling, ultimately, to support displaced people in urban environments in any meaningful way. So I would argue that we need to have a radical rehaul of the humanitarian system and one that acknowledges cities and their people and governments as key partners in supporting displaced people and work to support them in more serious ways. So I think I've stayed within time. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Romola, for uh, giving us um, a very unique perspective. Um, and um, Amara Zuz, please go. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. And thanks a lot for uh, all the speakers for the wonderful um, interventions. And thanks a lot for uh, you, Dr. Beecher and Dr. Mariana, for, the, uh, for organizing this important and timely uh, discussion uh, for very much sad, sad and tragic reasons, and also for including me in this um, conversation. Uh, there is one point that I wanted to respond from the uh, topics that you send us as suggestions, and the point that I want to highlight in the next maybe five to 10 minutes is how do we narrate the question of displacement uh, and who has the right to write the story of displacement. And I think we have seen in some of the uh, presentations at the beginning that there is the humanitarian uh, uh, tourism, like people traveling actually, there's the aid tourism as well that we see in many countries as in Lebanon. But we also saw in the presentation today at the beginning that uh, there are people traveling uh, for tourism uh, to, uh, to Ukraine these days. And uh, my, my research and my focus is um, on Syria, where I'm also from. Um, and as many of you know, that uh, Syria is one of these uh, wars that started as a main headline in the news. And now it's suddenly, not suddenly, gradually turning into a footnote, actually. Like we hardly hear about Syria, even though the situation is still uh, tragic and the lives of millions of people are still uh, uh, almost on hold or on the waiting process as millions of people remain uh, displaced over half of the population. Uh, so uh, really what I'm going to share with you today is about uh, writing the narrative, writing the story of displacement, uh, who has the right to write it and what story we tell uh, about wars and conflict and um, displacement. Um, so to share my screen, I have prepared a few slides, so please do feel free to stop me when I run out of time. Uh, so the focus or the title of this um, short intervention is about a forthcoming paper that will be published in the next couple of months, uh, which is titled Our Pain, Their Heritage Project. Uh, this is where I usually focus on. Uh, it's uh, Syria. For those who aren't familiar with the region, um, the, the region witnessed an uprising in 2011, in March 2011, as a wider uh, struggle for the Arab Spring that was sweeping across different countries in uh, North Africa and the Middle East, uh, including uh, Tunisia, um, uh, uh, Egypt, and uh, Bahrain, and other countries, and Syria. Um, since 2011, um, many cities have been like many neighborhoods have been heavily destroyed uh, and raised to the ground. And my focus is on Homs, where over half of the neighborhoods have been heavily destroyed. So imagine a city in ruins and where uh, a country where more than um, half of the population has been displaced from their homes and not only displaced as refugees where we see in, in places like Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan, uh, mainly in the neighboring countries and also beyond like in, in Germany, but also millions of people, over 6 million people remain today internally displaced inside Syria, which their plight is, is really very often um, unheard of. We hear about the refugee crisis, we hear about uh, uh, those who cross the borders, but very often we, we don't hear about those who remain uh, displaced internally. 
Um, my work, um, as I saw uh, my colleagues today, like uh, Beth and uh, Elizabeth, is also centered about the notion of home, um, which is not about the conversation today, not the focus of uh, this paper, but it's the focus of my forthcoming book that uh, you kindly mentioned in the introduction. And I focus on, I borrow from this um, concept domicile, which is the killing of home. Um, and by home, it's not only the physical and the tangible um, material uh, place that we call home as our flats or houses or uh, apartments, but it's really about the symbolic destruction of that sense of belonging, identity, and um, 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 a heritage, let's say, even in, in places where an entire city is raised to the ground. So it has been central to my work, and um, I hope you can uh, engage a little bit more with uh, writings as we, we see that we overlap with different themes about home. And for today's focus is, I think I wanted to put this quote because it's uh, uh, quite central to what I want to say. And um, as you see in this uh, quote here by Rebecca Solnit, who wrote uh, Hope in the Dark, that every conflict is in part a battle over the story we tell or who tells and who is heard. And I think why I wanted to focus on this quote for as a start for this today's presentation is that um, I and I think many people who live in a conflict situation, we feel that our story is not told by us, but it's often taken and told by other people to talk about us. And there isn't enough space for the impacted communities as in any conflict situation as what we see in Ukraine or in Afghanistan or in Palestine or other situations, other regions where the people who are impacted, they wouldn't have the space to tell their stories and how important it is to tell this story. This has been the struggle for many of us um, who see that our pain uh, has been transferred into a funding project or an opportunity to make projects and initiatives and uh, events about Syria, but very often without, and I think like uh, what my colleague Romala was saying about a meaningful conversation with displaced communities, so I have felt, and I think many people would agree that there has been a lack of meaningful conversation with impacted communities, at least in the case of Syria. And I just put this example here of a replica of uh, um, Palmyra's uh, Ark, uh, which was destroyed by ISIS and it was rebuilt and uh, featured here as a 3D replica here in London in Trafalgar Square where, I'm, where I live. And you see Boris Johnson, who is currently the prime minister opening, uh, launching that event where he, he says, and I quote, we are here in the, defi uh, in the spirit of defiance defiance of the barbarians who destroyed the original of this arch and destroyed so many other monuments and relics in Syria and in the Middle East and in Palmyra. Congratulations to the Institute of Digital Archaeology who built this replica. How many digits do you think Daesh deserve? I think two digits to Daesh. And he continued by writing about this specific example that we, he said that we have some of the most greatest uh, archaeological experts in the world. I hope that the government, i.e. the UK government, will fund them to go to Syria and help the work of restoration. Syria's future will be glorious, but that will partly depend on the world's ability to enjoy the glorious past. British experts should at, be at the forefront of the project. Why I'm showing this uh, quote here and these quotes, it's about the Syrian heritage, but it's narrated by somebody who is not from Syria. And what you see here is between brackets and brackets, like a British expert should be at the forefront of the project, um, which you can see about who has the power, who has who has to be on the forefront, who has to be uh, called the expert. And you can see um, how it's framed by political powers as in the UK, for instance. So for me, the heritage that we can see also a lot of NGOs and international organizations, including INGOs as well, looking at the Syrian pain through the lens of heritage heritage to tell their own story, to make money out of it, to make a project, but without very often without engaging with the Syrian people. And this has led for enormous amount of publications in academia, in the international organizations, in newspapers about writing the story of Syria through the lens of heritage. And I think like sadly to say, but I think even now a new pattern similar to this happens with the Ukrainian situation where you see a lot of um, organizations talking about heritage, but 
heritage for whom and heritage by whom and whose heritage and why i think like my colleague was asking why are you here volunteering so that question of why is so crucial uh, some people would go to compete others would be going to help the people so this these dynamics also you can see in different conflicts now the foreign agencies the international agencies they might have their own agendas and their own priorities and very often they would think that rebuilding a mosque or a church or a bridge or a piece of stone would suddenly bring people together so they come with their own priorities on what's important and i think that lack of engagement with the people might cause harm to communities which are already living in vulnerable and extreme situations and here there is a, a powerful quote by professor lim meskel um, incredible colleague and friend um, who wrote this uh, important book called a future in ruins who says uh, who criticized how the unesco suggested some zones to protect the heritage as if heritage is the only thing to protect and she says here i'm, I'm hoping to wrap up uh, so, but she says in this quote that the danger here is intervening in, the, in rescuing the purely material heritage, often a classical antiquity for which Western nations consider themselves to be the legitimate inheritors, while not fully addressing those living and dying through the ongoing conflict or the resultant refugee crisis, which in summary here, she's saying that the protection sometimes of international organizations is about the material, the physical, the heritage, but not the people, not the people who live in this um, heritage site. And um, that's one of the dynamics that I'm interested in on who shapes the space, uh, who has the power to write the story, who has the power to protect. And this is the same we can see in The Guardian, an, an example here where the entire article references only organizations that work in Geneva and in Berlin and outside Syria, but does not mention any charity working inside Syria, even though there are tens of different Syrian charities working on the ground to protect uh, uh, the physical built environment. So I think even citing and referencing and telling the story is important on how do we reference and who do we hear and who do we want to make visible. Um, in the space. This all, uh, uh, let's say, rage or unhappiness or discomfort has led me to write this uh, tweet. Uh, uh, when was that? In, in last year, in 2021. Um, so I'm wrapping up uh, very soon. And I said um, it was viral. Uh, it went, uh, it was read more than 1 million times. And I just read here that as a Syrian in the UK, I've seen how some UK based academics turned our pain and trauma into an opportunity for them who saw in us a funding opportunity. Many of them wouldn't speak the language, know our struggle or care about us, but hey, it's good for their career. Um, so to wrap up, that was uh, just a summary of what I meant by our pain is their heritage project. And I think it's, it's really about the dynamics on telling the story during the conflict, um, regardless of which region, which geography, and how important for um, NGOs and international NGOs to, to have a meaningful and deep conversation with people who aren't just supposed to be told or narrated, but they have the right to tell, to tell their story. And thank you so much for this. Thank you, Omar. Um, that was yet another powerful presentation today. I think we really have um, very interesting and important um, different views, right, on um, how humanitarian effort is unfolding, what role it plays in different parts of the world. Peter, um, how do you want to proceed? We have one Q&A. Um, uh, yes, uh, th thank, thank you to all the panelists. Yeah, so uh, anybody in the... Uh, um, out there in the audience, we can't see you, but uh, please use the question and answer um, to uh, offer any questions. Uh, we do have one question, so we can start with that and close by thanking uh, close by thanking our um, our panelists and to our audience. And um, I hope you enjoyed this uh, discussion. Oh, and one other thing, the, the, the recording will be uh, posted on the Hunter College Department of Geography and Environmental Science webpage. So look for that next week if you want to uh, refer people to that. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Everybody. Thank you so Thank much. You. That was Have amazing. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you.